welcome to Your Family Dog, a podcast dedicated to helping families love living with dogs. Here are your hosts, Julie Fudge-Smith and Colleen Pilar. Hi, welcome back to Your Family Dog. I'm Julie Fudge-Smith and I'm here with Colleen Pilar. And today we have a very special guest, Michelle Sevigny, who is the owner and creator of Dog Safe Canine First Aid. She's also their head instructor. She is located in uh, British Columbia, Canada, but uh, she has online courses and her goal is to maximize awareness of canine first aid and safety to dog owners and dog professionals through her online courses and in-person courses in select cities. Plus, she offers safety products and community programs. So thank you so much for joining us today, Michelle. We're really glad to have you here to talk about this really important subject that most people don't even think about until it's too late. Yes, thank you for the invitation. I'm pleased to be here. And thank you for all you guys are doing for dogs out there. So, yeah, good stuff. All We're right. so glad to have you here, Michelle, because first aid is definitely one of those topics that you don't think of until it's uh, five minutes after the time you needed to know. <laughs> so <laughs> what would you say is the most important thing families need to think about from the from the aspect of first aid for their pets a lot of what we do and because we're focusing on canine first aid and responding but it starts way before that accident that that happens and there's so much that we can do whether it's a family or dog professionals like yourselves to prepare for that accident that happens because like you said it doesn't happen like okay i'm ready you know go it's going to happen in the middle of the night it's going to happen on a sunday afternoon when we're just enjoying the family so preparedness and the knowledge that we can gain can start now and we do have a number of tips that we're going to go over which is great to start and the easiest thing is just to prevent if I don't have to do anything at all in a first aid situation because it hasn't occurred even better so a lot of it our focus is on prevention of illness and in injuries so things like like the puppy proofing of the house, for mm -hmm. example, right? We, we talk about the electrical cords and with so many gadgets around, we've got, you know, electrical cords are, are, are getting more and more. So general puppy proofing, watching, you know, doing a scan of your environment for things at the dog's level that can prevent, say, the um, a choking situation. So everything, you know, up off the floor. It's sort of that you're, again, your basic puppy proofing. We can also look at things that we don't normally think about. Can they get into the food cupboards in the, in the uh, kitchen? And as a trainer, people used to ask me, oh, I'd love to teach my dog how to open up the fridge. I'm like, really? Do you really want to teach your dog <laughs> how, to, how to open up the fridge? <laughs> let's, let's think about that. So, um, we're just getting into spring now. So looking at the yard, right? A lot of spring cleaning is happening. So how are those chemicals stored in the garage? And, you know, dogs will get into things that we don't think, like paint, where they're not, um, you know, we don't think they're going to ingest something like that, but they're just curious, right? They're curious with their mouth. So looking at the yard environment as well. We've had a lot of storms up here in British Columbia this season, and a lot of fences and gates have taken a hit, you know? So we're looking mm -hmm. at things like exposed mm -hmm. nails where dogs might be bumping into the gate when they're doing dog play in the yard, for example. Knowledge and training, right? Checking your dog's um, training knowledge of things like leave it, that getting that solid recall, dropping it, that will prevent something like a toxic situation, for example, or being hit by a car if they're out running without that solid recall. And not only just the injuries, but also the illnesses. So having a really good relationship with a vet and you know, you are your dog's primary caregiver, but your vet is a very valued part of your team. So we want to make sure you have a good fit with the vet and looking at things like um, having, uh, whether it's annual or just a regular wellness checks, especially as the dog gets older. So, and also exercise. So adequate exercise and also appropriate exercise, depending on the time of the year, the weather, your dog's fitness level to begin with, etc. So, Preventing illness or injuries is the easiest thing to do, and it's also something that we can start immediately, and it doesn't cost anything in the sense of going through that checklist. Awesome. That is very helpful. Very good. Very helpful. Well, I was thinking when you're talking about, you know, broken fences and stuff, not just nails sticking out, but now you have splinters that we may chew on and get them lodged in our throat, and 
maybe chewing on something that has paint on it that we don't want them to chew on. So there's all kinds of reasons why you need to to pay attention to the environment, not just because they might bump into something, but because it might be a temptation to mouth. Absolutely. And we know that dogs are exploring everything with their mouths. So it's, you know, treated wood versus untreated wood. It's, yes, um, uh, flowers and plants and all those things as the bulbs come up in the springtime. And I've got a Labrador right now. So it's like everything gets you know, <laughs> in the mouth. <laughs> so looking at things like that. And again, it's, it's we can't prevent everything, but it's we, we can go through sort of our, a mental checklist or going through your house and prevent the the obvious ones. And if you have a close call with something, then it takes the time to step back and go, okay, how do I prevent this thing from happening again? You know, does your does your gate become unopened um, on, has happened on one occasion and your dog has gotten out? You know, the longer they're away, the chances of the first aid might be happening. So we need to take a step back and go, how do I secure that gate so it doesn't happen again? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, one of the things, um, I think you have this terrific top five safety tips your dog wants you to know list, which we will have available as a link on our website so pe- owners can can hook, can hook jump in on that and take a look at it. Um, number two, you, you talked about number one, which is preventing illness and injuries. Number two is prepare in advance with supplies, equipment, and resources. So yes. if owners were to have just a few things on hand, to help their dog out in first aid, what would you recommend that they go out and get immediately? So two things I'd recommend is one, the supplies for your basics of wound care. The wounds are probably the thing that I get stopped in the parking lot the most. If they see dog safe on my car, people will run up and ask me about my dog's got this in their paw. They've got this, you know, it's wounds. It's those simple basic wounds. We can talk about CPR and I think we will talk about, you know, if we have got time later, but that's, that's an unusual circumstance. It's the wounds that are sort of ones Mm -hmm. that, you know, that come up all the time. So a canine first aid uh, kit stocked with the basics of wound care and knowing how to use them. So things like the gauze pads, the nonstick pads, the, the, the vet wrap, etc. The other thing that I would keep on hand is something to help with aiding of transportation. So whether you've got a small dog or a large dog, it's something to help you if you have a serious injury or whether it's a just a, a lameness in a leg, they need help with moving to, to get to the vet and that can cause stress. So things like a sling that you can use to help with a large dog walking, you want to have a soft and also a hard stretcher, so a small dog and a large dog, um, and also the ramp is also really handy to help them get into the vehicle, into your house, into the vet's office. So those three things to help with transportation because that's what causes stress (laughs) when you're you're having to get somewhere Mm -hmm. someplace like to the vet um, without having the supplies and then take the time to teach your dog what to do with that transportation. Teach them how to use the ramp before you need to do it. Keep it fun. Use the use the food, etc., so that they're not stressed by it. And the first time they're trying to use it is when they're hurting. We don't want that to be um, the first time. So making game out of the stretchers, making a game out of the slings, and the slings. You know the reusable shopping bags that we all use in the cloth mm-hmm. bags. Those have got two handles. You just take scissors, you slice it down the side. And now you have a sling. Perfect. <laughs> so it's something that you. You can keep on hand and it's easy and we probably already have it. We're just using it in a different way and teaching the dog in advance about how to use it. Do you have a photo of a dog wearing a sling that way? I'm sure I do somewhere on the website and I can send you a link. I'm sure we've got a social media post about it. I'll send you the link if you want to do that in your show notes as well. Really helpful because because when you say it, I can totally picture it and I can see how valuable that would be. But I think for some people, they might not picture it and and being yes. able to see what you're talking about with this ordinary household item that's really helpful yes because when you said sling yes, i was like absolutely. i don't have a sling i was busy giving myself bad <laughs> bad dog family uh points right here and then <laughs> and now i'm like i have a sling because i just learned how to make it yay me <laughs> And Colleen, what you just said about, you know, giving yourself bad dog, you know, we, when we're talking about these things that we can do in advance, I'm only talking about them is because I've been in the place where I haven't Mm -hmm. had them. (laughs) This is why I started Dog Safe is because I was in the place where I was transporting a dog in the middle of the night with an injury. I didn't know how to do it. It didn't go well. And it left me with that, oh, I'm a bad dog person. (laughs) (laughs) So, but then we look at changing things. So everything we do at Dog Safe is not about pointing fingers and blaming and you didn't do this and why didn't we do that? It's like, hey, we're all here because we love our dogs, right? We want to look at things that 
we can do better. And these little tiny tips, whether it's, you know, taking a full class or just joining us on social media or listening to your podcast, you take this little bit of knowledge and you just keep adding to it, adding to it, adding to it, adding to it so that we're there for our dogs. Awesome. Yeah. Keeping it mm-hmm. positive. Okay. Um, the other thing is, I was going to say too, is that in a pinch, you can also use your leash as a sling. I have done that. Absolutely. And- Um, Because when when Zuzu got caught in a weasel trap, um, I had a harness on her on the front so I could grab onto the harness with one hand and then I slinged her with the leash in with the rear end because that's all I had. We were out for a walk. Yes. um, So, you know, you can be creative. And and if I hadn't had that, I probably would have taken my coat off and used that as a sling. And that is showing, Julie, what you said about, you know, I'll do this or I could have do that. And that's getting it thinking because you've had a scenario where you've gone, this is what I did and what could I do again? And I go out for walking with my dog, especially in the summer. I don't carry a backpack full of first aid supplies. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm out enjoying my dog. <laughs> so then you've got to get creative. But if you sort of, if you know, if you've even thought about it, then it gets your brain working and thinking about what I could do if I didn't have that piece because I've thought about it at one point. Mm-hmm. If you're you know, what you might have at home may be different than what you may use when you're out, you know, having a picnic or just going for a walk. So it's absolutely true. It trains you to be flexible. It trains you to be creative. Um, But if you've addressed it initially in sort of that, you know, real life scenario and the possibilities, then it just adds to that benefit when you really need it and being things like a leash absolutely and the reason I like the slings with the shopping bag is because it got handles and in the emergency you know grabbing a leash is not the same as having those secure handles but it will absolutely right. work if that's all you have so yeah good thinking yeah okay so um those are all great suggestions um what are you the, the third point in your five in your was it five tips okay yeah is uh, you think I should be able to count to five, but apparently I'm (laughs) failing on that today. Know the four general signs of illness or injury and conduct regular head to tail checks. It seems to me that is an incredibly important one that everybody can start out with right now. Absolutely. Because again, when we talk about canine first aid, you know, our brains sort of think, ah, right, when you you see the blood on the dog's paw, that's when, you know, first aid is. Or we think of first aid as, you know, CPR type of thing. But it it starts, again, way before that happens. So the four general signs of illness or injury, just for almost any living thing, would be a change in appetite, a change in thirst, a change in their energy levels, and a change in behavior. And you know, these are the first thing the vet's going to ask you when you go in there and say, are they eating, are they drinking, etc. So when I look at appetite, again, I have a Labrador. Everything is about food. She's running across the yard to go where the food is in order to get fed in the breakfast for the morning. When I'm thinking about, is there something going on with my dog physically, I may notice something in a change in appetite. And it doesn't mean that I'm not eating, you know, she's not eating breakfast at all. It may mean when she's running to get to that breakfast she's she's doing it in that trot where normally she would do it in a full-blown run well what is going on there then for her in a physical manner because that you know ability to to go get her food is different or um the thirst maybe they're they're drinking less and then the question becomes well how much is do your dog normally drinks on a day yeah. right <laughs> and we could we we can mm-hmm. guess but so we recommend you know documenting this so we know this is the food they eat and I when I'm talking about food I'll look at stuff going in and stuff going out so on that food sheet will be this is what your dog eats this is how much they eat this is a change in their feces one day this is the 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 single vomiting episode at the three in the morning it all goes on that sheet because it's about digestion and food and what's going on so thirst also becomes how much water are they taking in how well how much is there so at least annually check how much water your dog is taking in so it's just a 24-hour period fill up that measuring cup put it in the dish let them free drink all day in 24 hours at the end of it you're either checking how much is less or if you've added more so that you have an idea my dog drinks three cups of water approximately every day excellent so when I start to think I think she's drinking more you test it now she's drinking six cups a day something is going mm-hmm. on <laughs> All things being equal, whether exercise, etc. So again, energy levels, what is normal for your dog. And then the behavior one is really, really critical. This is the one that will really tip off to you because you know your dog's best, right? The family knows the dog best. Um, 
what is going on. And we want to kind of try and rule out the behavior from a training perspective, right? Something may be changing. So for example, um, a dog that alert barks at the neighbors whenever somebody walks by the street and they bark just as they're walking by. Maybe they've stopped barking and you haven't done any training, you know, to have them stop barking. So something, what's going on? That So it might be the absence of a normal behavior that could be a physical basis. Maybe they're not feeling quite as well that they feel the, the need to alert bark or they don't, you know, I don't care what's going on outside. I'm more concerned about what's going on in me because our dogs don't raise the red flag to say I'm hurting inside. We look at things like a change in behavior. Another example, my dog, um, this last 10 days, she's had uh, an injury in her back right knee area. But a, a few weeks before that became more obvious, she was sitting on the couch and sitting more than laying down. Normally, they jump on the couch, do a little spin, lay down. Well, she'd be jumping on the couch and sitting and looking at me, <laughs> all things being equal. Anytime where I'm asking myself or I would encourage other dog owners to ask themselves, if you're thinking, that's weird, make a note mm-hmm. of it, right? So I made a note of it. Seems to be s- sitting on the couch more than laying down. And then as the week went on, ah, now look what's appearing. Now look what's appearing. When did it start? It didn't start the day she yelped. It started back when those other right. things were going. So that's sort of that change in behavior. It just gets us in the mindset of really observing our dogs um, and making a note of it is important part. So documenting in whichever way works for you. We have a, a product that, you know, will prompt you and it's a journal that you can write things down but any method is going to work um, to get you really in tune with your dog awesome mm-hmm. yeah that's really helpful because yeah. changes do tend to kind of creep up and then you don't know exactly how long has this been going on or anything like that yeah absolutely and then just finishing up there with the conducting the regular head to tail checks the same thing we got to know what's normal for a dog so that we when we find that lump on them well when did that start <laughs> We recommend about once a month getting your, you know, your hands on them so you're feeling your dog all over, you're looking at your dog all over, you're smelling them all over, and you're listening to the sounds that they make for either additional um, sounds or, or things on their body or the absence of it will may signal that something is going on. And again, just document it so that we know what the baseline is because every dog mm-hmm. is different. Right. And I think the other thing is, is, is we're not asking you to write an essay on what's going on no. with your dog. This can be just a sentence or two, like um, sitting more on couch and lying down. That that's all you need to write down, you know. Or, yes. um, you know, nails heard the nails on the floor. That may mean you know hadn't heard them before. I mean, just it can be very simple little things. Yes. And if you and then we also had we did one on a, a checklist yes. that we'll make a link to as well. That a monthly checklist that you you know you go through the questions and ask answer either yes or no. I find the checklist uh, really helpful. I do that once a month with my dog. And then if I have a weirdness, like the middle of the night vomit, I try to throw it back into this month's thing. I'll add a little date and say, okay, here, you know, here was, I discovered a vomit or whatever. My dog is getting older and he's doing well, but some days he skips breakfast. That's worth noting. How how often is that happening? Having some record of that can be helpful as we move forward. Absolutely. And it yes. can be done in whichever way that's going to work for you. That works with your brain. It works with your mm-hmm. lifestyle and, and your family. It's the point is just getting it down somewhere because it things like a simple vomit. It might just been they got into something on that walk and you'll never. Right. It, it's done. It's over. But there's other things that start now and then they progress. And now you're dealing with a very serious uh, situation. Cancer, for example. Now you're on. You've got lots to record and whatnot. So it gets you in the habit again of just paying attention. So you also recommend right. people know and how to take their dog's vital signals, vital signs. And I think that's something that a lot of us don't know how to do. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. You bet. So vital signs are like the signs of life. So it's the first thing your vet's going to do when you walk in going, something's wrong with my dog. So it's the first things that we can do when we're at home. So it can help us make the assessment. I need to go to the vet now, or maybe it's something that I can then monitor at home. Um, because I know all these other things about my dog and make the assessment that my dog is more comfortable at home and I don't need to go to the vet yet or ever. So when we're talking about the signs of life, we're talking about respiration, we're talking about heart and pulse rate, and we're talking about body temperature. The body likes to be you know, within those normal ranges. If it's out of that range, to what degree can signal different trauma in the body and how we're gonna react. So for example, respiration, the normal rates, 15 to 30, 
breaths per minute is the average average excuse me the average respiration rate for dogs the smaller the dogs the faster the respiration rate generally the larger the dog the slower the respiration rate generally and just catch it while you're watching your dog sleeping or they're relaxed at home watch their chest rise and fall for a count of one check over a number say 15 seconds times that number by four that gives you your respiration rate per minute it gives you a starting point so again you know what's normal so then how will you know what's abnormal if you don't know what your starting point is so respiration rate is an easy one heart and pulse rate the average ranges are 60 to 160 beats per minute again like the big big irish wolfhound or the the big great dane they're going to have this lower heart rate generally like think of a big elephant or the smaller dogs everything about them is fast they're going to have generally a faster heart rate and two ways you can check it check your dog's heart on their left side of their body so you can do it when they're standing or when they're laying down and just elbow bend their elbow back to where it kind of naturally hits the chest Place your arm, your hand in that area, and you will feel the heart beating. Check how many times it beats in 15 seconds times by four. That'll give your beats per minute. Don't be alarmed if you cannot find your dog's heart (laughs) on that body. Some dogs might have, you know, really thick undercoat or whatnot or a little extra layer of fat maybe. Um, So another place you can find is the femoral artery, which runs down the femur or the back leg either leg of the thigh just clasp your hands on the inside of that thigh kind of up where the leg meets the body and wiggle around with about the pressure you would use to find your own pulse on your neck or your wrist and until you find the one that's beating it's there and you just gotta once you're in the general area you will find it again count how many times in 15 seconds times by four that'll give you a heart or pulse rate per minute. Again, it's a good starting point. So if something's going on with your dog, you might have an increase in that pulse rate and it might signal to you something's more serious, something's more traumatic. I need to get uh, veterinary assistance with this. And then again, like the other ones, keep it fun. Keep it, you know, your dog's going to go, what are you doing (laughs) if you've never done that before? (laughs) So make sure you're keeping a, a fun game out of it. Lots of treats while you're digging around down under there and practice until you're comfortable by going, oh, yep there it is oh yep found it there it is so you're not wondering where it is when you really need to know the last vital sign is the temperature again bodies like to be in that that normal range which for um, your American listeners is 100 100 (laughs) to 102 Fahrenheit (laughs) think of that Disney movie 101 Dalmatians boom you're right in the middle there and then for your Canadian or international listeners 37.8 to 38.9 Celsius that's what the dog likes to be so you need to know again what's normal we are using a rectal thermometer um, so it's that's another piece of equipment you want to have in your first aid kit I tend to keep you know my dogs have theirs, I have my own, they're separate, so we get to a different one for your dog. And again, keep it fun. Follow the directions on your thermometer, you're only inserting it just a little bit past that silver tip, most of them have the silver tip for the readouts, and then again, record it so that you know what that baseline is. And then if something happens in the future with your dog, you're like, oh, okay, I think she's hurt this or she's not eating, take your vital signs. Are they normal? Are they out of range? It will help you make a decision. Yeah, we did that. Um, I- when I tried to take a temperature, my dog, uh, Bingley, was just, he just seemed off one day. It's like, yeah, you're just off. And his back was kind of arched. And I'm like, what is going on? And I took his temperature. It was 103. And I finished getting ready. I took it again. And it was starting to creep up. And we immediately went to med bed. It was that one, he wasn't, he wasn't acting normal. But it was really that temperature that told me this needs to be taken care of. And um it was that I've always been really grateful for learning how to do that because I, uh, his temperature just kept going. It finally went up to at least 105. So I started going up fairly high and they, luckily we were at the vet and they were able to get it down again. But, um, yeah. and it's what was not the that outcome? hard to do. What was the he outcome, had, Julie? He had a, some sort of like spinal infection and yeah. they put him on an antibiotic and told me with my two year old retriever, keep him quiet for a month. And I just went, you want me to what? <laughs> and that's... <laughs> <laughs> and that's a coat. 
<laughs> and that's a really good, that's a, it's a typical scenario that again, people will, will, you know, stop me and chat about or share with it in the classes as well is that something is off with my dog. And so they're going back, what they're really saying is those four changes. They're not eating the same, they're not interacting with the family in the same way. So that behavior is different. And then the next step would be go and take your vital signs. And there's some other tests that we would have, you know, students that go through as well, helps you make the decision. In your case, boom, you're off to the vet because that, that, temperature is, is higher than what you're comfortable monitoring at home. In other cases, it might be, you know, the dog might be not eating quite the same, but all the vitals are normal. Well, maybe I'll choose to monitor for 12 hours or 24 hours and then go or not go. So it empowers you to also look after what can I do to help with my dog in their most comfortable state as well. So you've talked about your classes and the learning, and one concern is always, I haven't done a, a a canine first aid one, but I've done CPR training and I'm always afraid yes. that if something happens, all of that information will be completely erased from my head. <laughs> so how, yes. how much are you, um, how do you help it stick for people? So really good question. And you know what, there's a certain amount that is going to disappear in your head and we will empower the students to go, this is what is going to happen, <laughs> right? You're not going to be perfect. So when we look at, you know, I come from emergency response background and it's training, 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 more training, 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 training for what will happen so that you are the professional and that you're ready to go. For your, for your family and your average dog owners, we want them to have the information. So come to a class, take a class, read a book, listen to a podcast, always building, always building, always building that information. But realistically, so we try and use it with, um, I'm not drilling students with things that they absolutely must have to memorize. That's the first mm -hmm. thing that goes, right? It needs to be into, so we use a lot of scenarios and story-based things because that mm -hmm. helps things stick. And we also encourage practicing. So it's like you take the class with us. You can't take an eight-hour class and expect to remember it three years from now. It does put a little bit of onus back on the students to go review the material, um, you know, reread the blogs, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, when we're talking about, say, for example, CPR, in the classroom, we will talk about the specific numbers, the specific techniques, you know, the exact way of doing things that is, you know, been science to determine that this is the most effective way. But I will finish the segment by saying to students, you know what? Heart is not beating, squish the chest. Dog's not breathing, blow on his nose. If you forget all the numbers, you will remember those two things, those two actions, and that could have a positive impact on, on what you're doing. So it kind of takes the pressure off. If I don't remember how to do anything, I don't want students to go, I'm not going to do anything mm -hmm. at all. We want you to do something, mm -hmm. even though it may not be perfect. It's something is better than nothing. And that is, that's a good thing. That a good, does that kind of absolutely sense? does. Yeah. Um, Julie's daughter, Emma, was talking with us about a canine emergency that occurred at her house. And she had taken your course. Um, and yes. it was interesting to talk with her about the fact that in that moment of panic, information did come back to her. And some of what you've said about how you helped set people up for success and sort of looking at the, the various aspects of your dog, what's different, what's the piece I need to be most focused yeah. on, um, I think is really helpful and comforting to people. We do have a, a little clip of, of Emma talking about this. Julie, do you think you could play that? Yes, I can. And here we go. So one time, um, my dog Tex and I were in the backyard getting ready for a bonfire that evening with some friends. And I had been collecting sticks and whatnot. And he'd been helping me and carrying them to the bonfire for me and dropping them. And, um, and I was on the back deck sweeping after we'd finished collecting some wood. And he was over by the fire pit just chewing on some sticks. So I wasn't really paying much attention to him. And suddenly out of the corner of my eye, I noticed that he was acting kind of weird. I noticed some weird movement and I looked over and I saw that he was kind of pawing at his mouth sometimes with one paw or the other, or he would kind of stand up on his back legs and use both paws to paw at his mouth. And my immediate reaction was a couple of things. My first thought was that's really weird. And he's never done that before. So subsequently something must be wrong. And then I remember thinking like, why would he be batting at his mouth? And then my immediate thought after that was, oh, that's a sign of choking. 
And then I thought, oh, he was chewing on some sticks. Like I kind of started racing, you know, putting this all together. Like, oh, you know, he was chewing on a stick. Maybe something broke off. He got choked. So I, I started walking towards him. And then the next, the immediate thought I had was, you need to stay calm. Because I could tell he was starting to really freak out. And I just remember thinking, if I lose it, if I get really anxious, or I go running over to him or whatever, it's just going to scare him more because he really picks up on my energy. And so I, as I started walking over there, I just decided, I was like, Hey, I'm going to be really calm. It's okay. And I started thinking in the back of my head, what all do I do if he is choking? And I thought, okay, first thing is he's got signs that he's choking. He's in a position where he would be choking, having chewed on a stick. He, um, and like, he's, he's kind of trying to cough, but I can tell he can't. And I, um, I remember thinking, okay, I'm going to open his mouth. I'm going to look what's in there. I got up to him and, and he looked at me and I could tell he was, he was trying to decide basically how nervous to get. So I just like, I started yawning. I remember like, okay, I need to start sending him some calming signals. Hey, it's okay. I kind of yawned. I said, Hey buddy, you're all right. And I got a hold of his collar and uh, he just really calmed down. Like he was really trusting dog and, so I, I took him in sort of a, a vet tech hold and I opened his mouth and I saw a stick at the back of his mouth. So I used my two fingers and just swept across the back of his mouth and was able to grab the stick between my two fingers and it just popped out to the side of his mouth. Um, and then he was totally fine. He coughed a little bit after that, but then um, he was fine. He had a little cut on the top part of his um, jaw. And, um, and that wasn't very serious and I didn't ever notice it again. So it must've cleared up pretty quickly. But I just remember thinking I, afterwards I was like, wow, I know a lot of times you go through this first day training and you remember thinking like, okay, this is all great in practice, but how much am I going to remember this in real life situations? You know, how much am I going to remember, oh, be calm or how much am I going to remember the stepwise process of putting the pieces together and then approaching the dog and then checking his mouth and then clearing his airway. But it all actually just kicked in. Like I remember very specifically and purposefully thinking through the steps that I had learned in first aid training. I remember thinking like very decisively, I need to. All right, there we go. <laughs> Yay, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? And it, it's, it's when I hear when people will send me emails or I get to hear stories about, you know, when they put some of their, their canine first aid training into practice. And while we never like to hear about dogs being hurt, I get so, it's just like, yay, right? And they'll always say, I didn't do it perfectly, but I did it. And it's like, that's it. That's all I want. It's like, it, it doesn't have to be perfect, but you did it. And you had some knowledge to put in there and skills. And that's like, yay, Emma, yay, Tex. Oh, that was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it just, and we had taken your course and it just, you know, it really did kick in even when she didn't wasn't sure that it was going to. So I think that's a that's a, a good reason to consider looking seriously into some canine first aid because it may kick in even when you when you fear that it yeah. won't. So and it's also one of those things again, you know, the the background being it's all about the dog. So we're slightly different than uh, human first aid in the sense of it's not it doesn't always just transfer right over to the dog because it's it's about the dog and they're not always going to say great you're here to help me sort of thing. So it's what we do there. Um, it, it's it's about how do you respond in that emergency and it, it's going to be different. So oh, I'm so thrilled that it worked out for for them. Yes. Good stuff. Thank you very much, Michelle, for joining us today. We will have links on our website to the top five safety tips your dog wants you to know, to yes. your website as well, so people can find out more about what you do and what you offer as far as courses and um, other information, products, and services. And uh, is there anything else that you would like our audience to know before we sign off? Again, just, you know, it's about peace of mind. It is so much more than than just the you know the learning how to do the paw wound, which is really important as well. But I get up in the morning and want to educate people about this because it ultimately it gives you peace of mind and it connects you with your dog on a deeper level, and that's what it's about. All right, terrific. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you all next time on Your Family Dog. Thanks for listening to Your Family Dog. Got questions? Interesting ideas? Colleen and Julie would love to hear them. 
call 614-349-1661 or visit www.yourfamilydogpodcast.com to share your thoughts.